We now continue with the third day of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committees. Chairing the committees, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. This part of the hearing runs about an hour. The joint subcommittee hearings will resume and come to order. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Schiff. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Benson, um, about the memo from uh, Mr. Altman that you've already testified about, I wonder if you could clarify something, please. I understand that the, that the uh, situation has been taken over by the Department of Justice, as you explained, but still, when Mr. Altman, who worked for you, said words like, the risks of a tragedy are there. Did you take any action whatsoever uh, on the basis of this memorandum when you received it? Congressman, without a question, once the FBI takes over in the Justice Department, they take over. They I run it. And I had all kinds of responsibilities otherwise. And what you saw from Mr. Altman, he sent me memorandums all day long. It was one of many memorandums. It was not any directive. It was not any conclusion. It was something that was passed through as something a thought he had at the moment. But the thought he had at the moment was very serious. Why would you not at least forward his memorandum to the Attorney General, who was the decision maker? Congressman, decision I have no question in my mind, uh, but what uh, the Attorney General's Department, Justice Department, had uh, exhausted uh, studies that they must have gone to great lengths to satisfy themselves on whatever the decision was. That was theirs. I had other major responsibilities I was working on. But Mr. Altman was working on this situation for your department, is that right? Mr. Altman had many other responsibilities besides this, and at that point, this became a side issue. It was not a major issue. The issue that the risks of a tragedy are there is a side issue? I beg your pardon? His statement is the risks of a tragedy are there, and his advice that, the, uh, that Mr. Koresh will, will concede if they, don't, uh, if they don't use this gas attack, you think that's a side issue, sir? I'm, you have to have some understanding of the issues we were involved in. All of them were important, but we dealt with our responsibilities the Justice Department is a major, major department, has all kinds of people to study these things, to make their studies and make their decisions. That was theirs. We had many other charges against us that we had to fulfill. So uh, you, you did not suggest to Mr. Altman that he contact the Justice Department directly with his views? No, I did not. I, I've been through that quite lengthy. You had another one that was we were, we were involved, of course, too, uh, in the World Trade Center explosion. And one of the things I think the ATF doesn't get enough credit for, actually, they're the ones that found the piece of metal uh, that was the turning point in the way of evidence that helped them catch the perpetrators or find out who they were. Um, Mr. Higgins, uh, I have a copy of some handwritten notes which I am informed are notes that you wrote in your own hand and, and signed Steve and addressed to Chuck, who I think is Mr. Sarabin. Am I, am I correctly identifying this? You're correct. All right. I'm told that these are notes you wrote during your review of the draft of the Treasury Department report on the, on the incident, Waco incident. Uh, not during the review of the draft. That, those were written after I was retired when I saw the final report, the Blue Book. And oh, so those relate to the Blue Book. Oh, these are notes on the final report? Yes. Uh-huh. I want to refer um, to one entry that you made where it says, at the, I'm quoting now, sir. At the top of the page, I did offer objections, but was continually overruled. I felt it was silly to call off a raid primarily for what I discerned was the real reason 
wanting to avoid embarrassment for Benson should something go wrong. Um, have I read correctly? That's on page two of this draft. You've read correctly. All right. Could you explain what you are talking about there? That is, when you say I did offer objections but was continually overruled um, yeah. and felt it was uh, silly to call off a raid primarily for what I discern was the real reason, wanting to avoid embarrassment for Benson should something go wrong. What is all being discussed there? Well, initially w when I sent, had asked if the plan be sent over or the, the notice be sent over, I did so because the raid was taking place in Texas and I was uh, aware of the fact that if there was something in the paper, and that was Mr. Benson's home state, that he would see it. Uh, this was to give him a heads up. As I, and th now, this is my assessment of the conversation that I had with Mr. Simpson. He can answer you himself. As I talked to John that day in terms of the questions and the concerns that he had, it was my sense after our conversation that the overlying concern was that if something went wrong, that it would be embarrassing to the secretary. And I simply didn't think that that should be how we judge law enforcement, but that's my assessment of the situation. Well, I agree with you that the assessment of law enforcement should not be based on the, the embarrassment of a, uh, of a government official. But who was it who was arguing that the raid uh, should, if I'm reading this right, should be called off or in any other way was arguing that the uh, a decision should be made based upon its embarrassment to the head of a department? Who was saying that? It wasn't an argument. That, it, was, it was based on a conversation that I had with John, and I'm saying that's my now, assessment. Who's with Mr. Simpson, I'm sorry. All right. uh, that's my assessment of the conversation that we had. He wasn't making that as an argument. That's my assessment of, of why there was so much concern. Well, he was saying what about, uh, I'm sorry, please, please back up just a moment, and, and then if there's time, I'll be glad to go to Mr. Simpson. I don't wish to exclude him, but I'm reading from your memorandum here. Uh, Mr. Simpson was saying what about embarrassment to the department exactly? As, as part of the discussion we had, he indicated that one of the concerns they had was if, if something went wrong uh, in, in Secretary Benson's home state, that that would be embarrassing uh, to the secretary. That's just part of uh, an entire conversation. Was that in relation to one specific aspect uh, of the raid, or was it in relation to the entire raid in, in all of its circumstances? It, it was in relation to if something bad happens, as it did happen, uh, that, would, that would occur, that could occur. So that was, that was the uh, discussion. All right, thank you. My time has expired. Time has expired. The chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me um, acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, that I would like to put in an opening statement for the record, please. And I'd ask unanimous consent for that to be admitted. So order. Without, without objection, so order. There is, um, I think, an important part to this hearing that also deals uh, with policy and philosophy. It's important because if we are to get away from this climate of fear and apprehension, Secretary Benson, we need to really put the light on for the American people. And the presiding chairman, who I respect, mentioned that these hearings are not about child abuse and not about the National Rifle Association, but they are about guns and children, lost lives, and civil justice. Mr. Secretary, did anything in your five-month investigation in the report that resulted suggest to you that the ATF acts as a predator organization, meaning that they go rampantly into civilian homes, private areas, finding or going without any knowledge of violation of law. Does it, with the very intense criticism that the report showed, does it in any way suggest no, that they not. do it in violation of the Second Amendment, or does it suggest that they are within the confines of their responsibility? It does not, it, it does not suggest the former, and it does uh, speak of their compliance with their orders and the law, and that they did not violate that law. Uh, there were some mistakes in judgment that took place, and the report goes into those uh, extensively and intensively. So we don't see an organization uh, rampant and going out after the prey? Absolutely not. 
And Mr. Secretary, did you not also note, or did this report not also note, that in the line uh, hierarchy, that you had several assistant secretaries of the Treasury who raised questions about this particular raid? I note uh, Noble and I note Simpson, even though I know they were advised, but they did raise questions, did they not? Yes, they did. And so there was a process of which there was involvement of management to question what happened. That's correct. And if we are to be constructive uh, with these hearings, then what we would try to do uh, is to possibly coordinate, to add uh, places of, of added coordination possibly, but we do know that there was a system in place where others had a chance to review. There's no question but what this report showed things that could have been done better. And uh, as soon as that report was in, uh, we began to further buttress those points uh, to try to improve the communication, uh, to try to improve the training. Uh, those things have been implemented. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I thank you for that. I think it is important to clarify uh, the context in which the ATF functions and that their function is not one uh, that, uh, with rabid disregard, uh, violates the Second Amendment so that they can be compared to organizations like the militia and others uh, that might counter those points. Let me go to Mr. Higgins uh, and uh, simply say to you that I appreciate uh, your service. Uh, but understand that as I have asked the Secretary so we can give a broad view, there also has to be a set of circumstances where someone is responsible. I want to separate out David Koresh for the innocent lives of Branch Davidians who were innocent themselves and the innocent lives of ATF officers, a wife of whom, maybe many wives, of a wounded officer is here in the audience and spoke to me uh, this week. I feel that burden. And Mr. Higgins, when the two uh, management persons, assistant secretaries in the Treasury had reservations and said no, uh, my question to you and my concern is whether you precipitately moved forward uh, because of we have gone too far, we've spent the money. I don't think that we can focus on spending the money when potentially lives would have been lost. My question to you, sir, is why you did not hold back? I think that's probably one of the fairest questions I've ever been asking. I did not because I thought that the people we had were fully qualified and competent. They had an excellent plan to resolve this issue in a peaceful and a safe manner, and that this was our last good opportunity to do that. I don't like being here anymore today, and I'm sure you don't either under these circumstances. And I can't tell you how bad all of us feel inside ATF. We didn't do it right, and we didn't do it safely. But I can also tell you that no matter how tough it is to be here or how badly we feel, it would be a lot tougher, and we'd feel a lot better, worse, if we had not tried to take some action to stop what was going on there. And they had done as we suspected they were, would do, and that is either to invoke a violent confrontation in the community and or commit mass suicide. It's tough to be here, but I'd rather be here explaining why we tried to do what we did than to try to explain to you later why we hadn't done something if what I thought was a likely scenario would occur. Thank you. General ladies, uh, time has expired. Thank you, Chairman. The Chairman is going to take his five minutes. Uh, Mr. Higgins, you indicated that uh, at the time of the raid that you were out of town. Is that correct? I was out of town for about four days prior to February 26th, but not out of town on the day of the raid, no. Okay. And Mr. Benson indicated that he was in Europe tending to more important business, is that right, at, at the time of the April 15th and the 19th? national conference at that point. That's correct. G7 countries. Um, and, and just so that I want, I want to make sure that I'm accurate in my notes here, um, relative to the document that was entitled Memorandum for Secretary Benson from Roger Altman. Subject is Waco, dated April 15th, 1993, whereby he says to you, the risk of tragedy are there, and if the FBI waits indefinitely, Mr. Koresh eventually will concede. My understanding is, is that you did not pick up the phone and talk to Mr. Altman. Um, did you 
talk to assist your assistant uh, secretary Josh uh, Steiner or his assistant Josh St uh, Steiner? Let me state, as I stated before, I received many, many memorandums from Roger Altman. This was no directive. It was not something asking for a decision. The responsibility at that point was the Justice Department and the FBI. They are the ones that proceeded in the second raid. And that was their jurisdiction. And they had all kinds of experts working with them on that one. So and I, I had other responsibilities to attend to. So I, I'm correct in saying that relative to this memo, you took no action. I thought it was already being taken care of by you, the Justice You assumed Department. others would take action, but you took They no had action. the responsibility. You I did not. You didn't pick up the call, phone or no, call anybody? No, I did not. I had other responsibilities, okay. none on that one at that point. Relative to uh, page 179 in the Treasury Department overview a report, relative to the comment that uh, they didn't want to, they wanted to avoid embarrassment for you, so they didn't want to call up the raid. Um, I guess the question is, if the risk of a tragedy were there, Secretary Benson, was it political pressure that caused CS gas to be used with such disastrous results? I told you I had nothing to do with that decision. That was under the responsibility of justice at that time. But I certainly don't believe that was a political decision. And you had nothing to do with any discussion on CS Not gas? Not at that point. That was justice. They were handling that one. Let me, let me say the congresswoman made a point about some of these charges on the ATF. They have been given this information that I think is important. In the past 10 years, ATF has investigated more than 50,000 cases involving nearly 80,000 suspects, served over 10,000 search warrants. And in that time, 230 lawsuits have been filed against ATF agents for alleged constitutional violations. There have been no, no adverse court decisions against any ATF employee in any of these cases to date. Let me ask you, going back to my question previously, uh, relative to page 179 uh, in Mr. Higgins' comments, where he said that they did not want to call off the raid because they wanted to avoid embarrassment for you. Do you think that was good judgment? I don't think that was the reason. I think they made their own decisions on the facts, not any question of embarrassment. Mr. Higgins, since you wrote the memo, any comment? No, I think, I think Mr. Benson's absolutely right. I mean, this is my interpretation of a conversation that I had with Mr. Simpson. Okay. Uh, I, Mr. Benson wasn't even in town, so I doubt that he had any knowledge of this or, or it reflected his views necessarily. I'll yield the balance of my time, Mr. Shavitt. Um, Mr. Simpson, just a couple of questions. To your, uh, to your knowledge, who was the highest ranking government official who knew about the initial raid uh, before it occurred? And when I say initial raid, I'm talking, of course, about the February 28th raid. Um, to my knowledge, I was. You were the highest ranking government official? Who, who uh, actually in office, yes. uh, who knew about it before um, uh, February 28th, yes, sir, that's correct. And what specific materials did you review uh, prior to, you or anybody in the Treasury review, prior to giving the ATF the go-ahead on the raid? Uh, not as much as we would have liked, Congressman. We had the, uh, the memorandum that Mr. Kyler brought to us. Uh, we had the benefit of a, of a this short... one page? Yes, sir. We had the benefit of a short conversation with him and then the benefit of a more extensive conversation with Director Higgins late in the evening. But this is the only written document? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair now recognizes Mrs. Lofgren from, Ma Lofgren from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I think it's important for us in trying to search out exactly what happened and how things could be improved in the future to understand the context in which this was happening. And I, I did want to make a brief comment uh, in response to Mr. Uh, Booyer's earlier comment. The need for context is so we'll understand things. Not, it's not to provide an excuse for misbehavior if there were any, although we have seen some mistakes. I haven't, I'm not sure I've seen misbehavior. <clears throat> to understand why uh, people did what they did, what they knew at the time, or what they thought that they knew at the time, and how that impacted the judgments they made. Uh, and, and I think it is very unfortunate that we are not going to get that whole truth and that whole context, because we are not going to be calling the reporters who had 
issued those series of articles starting in the February 27th that clearly were read by all the parties and contributed greatly to their understanding of what they were dealing with and the kind of situation they were dealing with. Uh, further, I'll, just by way of example, my mother died on February 25th. And this whole public event is like a blur to me. I wasn't paying any attention. Uh, on the day of the raid, I was giving the eulogy at my mother's funeral. So if you were to question me about any of these events, I would, it's just almost didn't happen to me because that was the context in which it, it occurred. For you, Mr. Benson, you had been here, Secretary Benson, actually I think of you as Ken's uncle. Um, you had been in your job for, what, 20? I suppose, around a month. Around a month. And at this time, wasn't your department also involved in dealing with the, I, the World Trade bombing Absolutely. that occurred right around this time? To what extent was uh, that disaster also calling on your attention in, in addition to the currency matters that you were dealing with in Europe? There's no question but what it was a, a part of our concerns at that particular time uh, and took part of our attention. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, the Secretary's job is one that gets into trade, gets into taxes, gets into budgets, and, and uh, it is a, all, my wife has told me that uh, I've now slowed down from 200% of my time to 135% of my time. But, uh, we're going to run it up a little today, I guess. Uh -huh. Mr. Higgins, I'm interested in, I've, I've seen this, uh, the memo uh, written by Mr. Q, uh, uh, to Mr. Um, by Mr. Kuehler to Mr. Langdon, and in the fourth paragraph, it talks about a little bit about the um, uh, Branch Davidians and points out that the, the only uh, male in the cult allowed to have sexual relations was uh, Mr. Korsh, although they call him Howell here, I guess that's his legal name. And that the, uh, what I'm wondering is how much you knew, given, uh, I'm sure you were also involved in the World Trade Center and there were other people uh, working on this. This wasn't uh, perhaps as uh, much in, in, uh, on the top of your agenda as that other event. How much did you know about the nature of the psychology of this group uh, when you were making the decisions on, on the first uh, raid? Well, I don't know that I knew that much about the psychology of the, of the group because I'm not sure that anybody truly knew what went into well, this individual's mind, but I did know a lot about the practices. They were not violations of ATF law, but they were violations of other laws. But, I knew about the illegal activities. Let me ask you this. Mr. Aguilera had documented um, the uh, practice of raping the little girls by Mr. Koresh and also had documented in his investigation the um, beating of the babies to the point where they had bled and, and had also documented that the men had been separated from their wives and were required to remain celibate so their wives could be uh, become eligible for Mr. Koresh and it was those uh, were also in the newspaper articles that were published about uh, this same time. Did, did that information filter up to you? I mean, that information obviously relates not to whether they deserve the full right of the protection of the Constitution. They do. And it's not a, about a federal crime, but would give some insight about how to do your job. Is this a group that would give up after they've given up their children to be? Is this a group that could easily say, yeah, I made a mistake? Uh, is it a group that's operating on a different kind of worldview? Did you have that kind of information? Well, I knew most of the information that you see both reflected in the, in the warrants and that you've just described. I did not know at all to, the, to that detail, but I, I knew enough to know that, that uh, uh, there was a serious problem. General ladies, time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from the uh, Southern Territory of New Hampshire, Mr. Blute from Massachusetts. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Before I yield my time, I would just like to join uh, all of my colleagues in telling Secretary Benson how much uh, high regard he is held in by members of both party in this in this Congress. Thank you. And, and on that, I will yield my time to Mr. Shadegg of Arizona. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, I would like to express my appreciation to each of the members of the panel for being here as well, and particularly you, Secretary Benson. Uh, Secretary, 
Um, I noted that you made some comments about the review that was performed by Treasury. Uh, to some degree, it seemed to me you were slightly defensive that anyone would look back into that. I, I presume as a former member of the United States Congress for many years that you don't think this Congress should abdicate its oversight obligation because an agency has written a report, do you? Oh, certainly not. Good. Okay. And, and I guess the other point I wanted to make on that, and, and let me be j very brief about it, uh, perhaps, and, and maybe I'll just ask you this outright, were you aware before you made those remarks that in testimony before this committee, um, your agents, Treasury agents, have had deeply conflicting views about the accuracy of that report. Indeed, yesterday, some of them testified they thought it was only roughly accurate, uh, roughly 70 percent accurate. And Mr. Higgins today said, he first said, yeah, I thought it was about 70 percent. He might have given it slightly higher than that. It seems to me that the American people ought to accept a standard better than 70 percent. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I think it's a much higher standard. I don't agree with that evaluation at all. And I can understand those fellows yesterday who had been demoted uh, having that kind of a reaction. Well, unfortunately, it's both people who have been demoted and people who had not been demoted. But in any event, I do think we have an oversight responsibility here. Um, um, I'd like to turn my questioning to Mr. Simpson uh, and specifically to the uh, what appears to be the only written memorandum that uh, came to higher level, higher ranking officials at Treasury before the raid, and that's the memo of 26 February uh, to Michael D. Lanigan. Do you have that memo, sir? Yes, sir, I do. Um, first of all, let me just going down it, and, and perhaps if Mr. Coulier wants to answer this question, he can. Are you, were you aware at the time, or are you aware now, that uh, the second paragraph statement that Mr. Howell had been acquitted of murder is not accurate? Um, I was not aware of that, no, sir. Okay. Um, one of the que questions I want to go into is in the next to the last paragraph, um, there is a statement that says, a well-reasoned comprehensive plan has been approved which allows for all contingencies. Had you seen such a plan? No, sir, I had not. Uh, do you know if the author of this memo, Mr. Coulier, had seen such a plan? No, sir, I do not. Mr. Higgins, had you seen such a plan? I had not seen such a plan in writing. I had discussed a great deal of the plan with the raid planners, but no, I, I had seen nothing in writing. Um, okay. Uh, indeed, were you aware there was no plan in writing? No, I wasn't specifically aware of that. I knew that certain documents had to be prepared in order to get certain approvals, but I was not aware of, or, nor did I think there was anything specifically wrong at that point that there was no specific plan outlining everything in writing at that point. Did you see this memo before the raid on the 28th? No, I did not. Who is the highest ranking individual that saw this plan before the raid on the 28th? Well, Chris is probably in the best position to answer. He may well have been. I don't know. He was the liaison officer, but I don't know if any of Perhaps you can answer that, sir. Yes, I provided copies of this uh, memorandum to Mr. Hartnett you know, upon my return from Treasury. And was he the highest ranking official? Yeah, I, I, I would, yes, sir. Okay. In uh, ATF. You wrote this sentence. Um, were you aware at the time you wrote that sentence that there was no written plan? Uh, no, sir, I wasn't. I based that on the, the briefing that I sat through and in, in, and in discussions with various division chiefs and headquarters. You know. Okay. At the time you wrote this memo, had you been briefed on the fact that the original plan was to conduct the raid on, I believe, March 4th, some several days later, and that it had to be moved up by five or six days because of the newspaper articles that came out? I don't believe when I wrote this that I was aware of why the date changed. I was just made aware of the date change and that I should notify, advise Treasury of what we were going to do. Okay. Um, were you aware when you wrote that it was a well-reasoned comprehensive plan uh, which allows for all contingencies that there were apparently little or no no go no go uh, procedures in it. No, when I wrote this, that was that was my opinion. I felt there was a well reason. That was the impression that I was under. That, we and that was just based on your discussions, not on having seen anything. That's correct. I hadn't seen the tactical plan, you know, or been briefed on it. You would agree that such a plan should include go or no go instructions for a raid of this magnitude, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, it seems to me a big issue here has been the a issue of surprise. Uh, and it seems to me that in any raid where you're going to do a dynamic entry, you're going to burst through the door without knocking and asking, surprise has got to be. I mean, just intuitively, surprise is an important uh, element. 
um, were you aware that apparently the agents in the field had not been told that if the element of surprise was lost, they should not go forward? No, sir. I have no knowledge in that regard. Uh, Mr. Higgins, were you aware that that communication had not been made? Well, I think you put it exactly right. I think it's, it's almost intuitive that you don't go if you don't have surprise because the entire plan is based on that. Uh, I, I thought the understanding we had in the field was even more safe and secure than that, and that is that when you go in on Saturday and Sunday, not if you've lost the element of surprise, but if you see anything that even looks unusual or abnormal, call it off because we simply don't want to take a chance. To me, that goes even further than having lost the element of surprise or whatever term you want to use. So I'm not aware that that wasn't passed on. I'd be surprised. My time has expired. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry the senior officials weren't more involved. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Slaughter from New York, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I will divide my time equally between my colleagues, Ms. Thurman and Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. Let me continue on with this then because, Mr. Higgins, you've talked recently about the fact that you were involved in the planning of that. Is this, cor is this correct? That's correct, improving the plan. Okay. In, in the report, there were, um, uh, Sarah Ben yesterday also, I guess, talked a little bit about this, about the questions that he asked uh, Agent Rodriguez when he came back and said that that had been a part, the report says that had been a part of the plan, that uh, he didn't really notice any guns or there wasn't anything really out of place other than the actions of Mr. Koresh. Is that correct? They developed, I think, certain guidelines they were going to look for, uh, certain things that he had done historically if he felt like somebody, ATF or someone else, was about to come get him. Some of the things he did was arm, put sentries up and things like that. So as in their tactical planning, they decided those are the kinds of things they were going to look for. Yes. And, and in fact, the report says he did that. Yes. Yeah, I understand he did. I think he asked all those questions and no one saw any guns or anything. And you believe he asked the right questions based on the plan? I think he think he... I think he thinks that he does, and I'm not here to quarrel. I think the plan also says that the undercover well, you were a part of the plan, so yeah. I, I need to get this and understand. The undercover, since... right. I think the plan also says that the undercover agent was to go in and see if things looked normal. Uh, if so, he was to come out and say that. Uh, part of his job was to see if things looked normal. I, you'll have to talk with him as to whether or not the undercover officer and the person who made the decision thought things were normal. But the, but the plan says that he asked those questions, and I'm just trying to get with those the right questions to ask. The only thing that they yeah. said was a little concerning was maybe Mr. Koresh has dropped his Bible and acted a little excited, but were there any movement? Were there any guns? Was there, did there seem to be anything, activity, that would have suggested that they would have what ended up being an ambush? I mean, yeah, I, I think it probably wasn't stated in any written plan that that's what they were going to do. But that's the kind of questions that I believe he and uh, Phil Winowski had agreed on in advance that would give them some indication uh, based on past experience as to whether or not anybody was expecting them. And those are the kind of questions they ask. And, and obviously all the answers were no, and I think that's why they went ahead. Okay, so that's why you believe, based on your knowledge of what the plan was, that they did do the, what, what was suggested that they would do then? I think that's why they did what they did, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then at this time, I'll yield the balance of my time to the gentlewoman from Texas. I thank the gentlelady from Florida, and I thank the gentlelady from New York as well. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I heard a character characterization of a comment that you made, and the comment uh, did not appear to suggest that. The characterization was uh, that you indicated, either by words or implication, uh, that you were on more important business. Uh, by being in Europe. First of all, were you notified of this uh, before you departed uh, to Europe and dealing with the business at hand? And so your, your, your comments uh, were not to say you were on more important no, business. I did, I did not Maybe you want that. to explain it, Mr. Secretary. I certainly did not say that. I said I was fulfilling my responsibilities there. I might further state that, uh, as I understood Mr. Higgins, uh, he stated that in 11 years that he had that service, uh, that he was not obligated to clear these things insofar as these arrests uh, with Treasury. I think that's correct. Uh, that has been changed subsequent to what happened there. We now require that. I think that's a very important note, and let me add that I appreciate as well the figures that you use with respect to the ATA uh, convictions and uh, various uh, 
uh, activities with respect to gun violation. If I, and I thank you, Mr. Secretary. I wanted to clarify that you were not in any way uh, denigrating the importance of this very great tragedy of which we sure. all experienced. Uh, Mr. Higgins, let me ask you, uh, if I might, to get back to the point that you made that caused you to pursue going ahead, the possibility of mass suicide. And of course, uh, when we all heard that, we were concerned because we were all, I hope, whether it be the American public or whether it be the decision-making individuals or those on the line, concerned about loss of life. Two questions. One, did the governor of Texas do anything contrary to the wishes of the ATF or did was that a cooperative effort? Let me give you the, the two questions, please. Uh, was that a cooperative effort? So any suggestion that the governor may have gone beyond uh, the, uh, if you will, a purview uh, of her responsibility or was in uh, uh, conflict with any information given by ATF? And then the second question is, as it was a SEC, why did you all not rely more upon uh, information about that sect and bring in individuals who might have been knowledgeable to assist you to prevent the loss of life. Uh, the, your first question, uh, I, I think the uh, secretary or the uh, governor of the state of Texas, I, I have no knowledge that she went beyond any <coughs> bounds of anything or had any particular disagreements or did anything that was, if your question is, did she do anything that, that was unusual or whatever? No, I, I think I, I think the office cooperated with ours in every respect. Uh, the second thing, did we check with enough experts on sex? Uh, Se could we have done sex. a better? <laughs> yeah, I can. With, could we have done a better job? Uh, no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> okay. He's answering did I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought you finished. And, and I can do it real quickly. Uh, no, we didn't do enough of that. Important question. No. Thank you. It is a good question. And, and no, I can't say in hindsight that we did enough of that. I can only say that the FBI did a lot of that during 51 days and got opinions that were 180 degrees in conflict from, quote, experts. So, number one, I don't even know who the experts are on the mind of David Koresh. I wouldn't know that today. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Mr. Chairman. Chair now yields to Mr. Barr from Georgia for five minutes. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Simpson, if I could ask you to direct your attention to two documents, which I believe you have before you. There are two memoranda, both from uh, Deputy General Counsel of the Treasury, Robert McNamara. One is uh, dated 9 April 93. The other is dated 14 April 93. The first document is number 17722. The second document is 18994. Do you have those? No, sir, I don't. Okay, let's get those distributed, please. Here's a copy uh, right here. I think we may have them. Um, Yes, sir. I think I have the documents to which you refer. Okay. Uh, while those documents are getting to you, lest any members of this panel think that uh, the statements by the gentleman from New York that it is standard operating procedure in the Department of Justice to direct, especially in writing but in any form, to agents of this government attempting to conduct an investigation to determine what went wrong in a shooting incident, that it is standard operating procedure to write memos saying stop interviewing people, stop gathering evidence, and don't take notes. That is wrong. That is not, in my experience as a United States attorney, appropriate. And I was also, would also direct you all's attention, if you think otherwise, to testimony two days ago by Assistant United States Attorney Bill Johnston, a disinterested party from our standpoint, who testified and he was the one that was conducting this investigation. When he saw these documents, he said, absolutely not. This is not the way the system ought to operate. An investigation such as ATF was attempting to conduct was a search for the truth. These documents reflecting explicitly directors from the deputy, the deputy general counsel to stop interviewing people and to uh, be fearful that anything critical of ATF might get into the defense hands or might get out is reason to stop an investigation that was directed very appropriately, that that is wrong. Uh, what I would like to request from you, Mr. Simpson, is if you could take a look first at uh, document 17722, which is dated 9 April 1993, and ask you if you're familiar with that document. Uh, no, sir, I am not. Okay, I presume your answer will be different for document 18994 since it is directed to you. Oh, uh, it, is, it is directed to me. It's a copy of uh, an interagency email memorandum. 
Okay. And are you familiar with that document? Um, I'm sure I've seen it. I don't recall having seen it. Okay. I would uh, direct your attention explicitly to the second page under a paragraph or a series of paragraphs labeled constraints where it says that the prosecutors do not want us to generate additional Jenks, Brady, or Giglio material or any oral statements which could be used for impeachment. It goes on to identify a problem that our information will be limited to what the TRs, I presume that means Texas Rangers ask which will focus on the gunfight and not necessarily on the other major topics in which we are interested. And then it goes on uh, to say the passage of time will dim memories uh, regarding uh, the possibility of future interviews. It concludes there on that page with a statement that the prosecutors are concerned that anything negative, even preliminary, could be grist for the defense mill in further justification for directing that interviews cease. It goes on on the second page to reference the Weaver case, which I presume is the case out in uh, Ruby Ridge. Uh, what questions, if any, does this raise in your mind as an ATF official at the time trying to conduct an objective uh, series of investigations, the shooting review, to determine, in fact, whether problems occurred uh, that needed to be remedied while witnesses were, had information fresh in their mind? Did this further uh, your investigation or impede it? Oh, Congressman Barr, I was not involved in any way in the investigation. At, at this point, I was completely out of it. I was no longer acting assistant secretary. Okay, then, then why, why was this sent to you then, um, sort of gratuitously? Frank, frankly, I think that's a good question. I think it was gratuitous. Let me ask you then, if you had in fact received this, would this be the sort of document that would lead you to the, to the belief that the Treasury Department was interested in a thorough, objective search for the truth or was concerned more about bad publicity and information possibly getting to defense attorneys in its search to determine whether or not what happened on February 28th was appropriate or whether problems occurred. Um, Congressman, most of what I understand about this document I picked up in the last few seconds. And, and my impression of it uh, is that it's the advice of our counsel that we should postpone or defer our internal investigation until the Justice Department criminal investigation is complete uh, I certainly defer to you as to what Justice Department policy is, but my impression is that it is standard for the Justice Department to ask agencies to defer internal investigations while the, a criminal the, investigation is underway. Let me, let me tell you, this document does not reflect Justice Department uh, uh, policy and is not the sort of document that, an, that a U.S. attorney or an assistant U.S. attorney interested in the search for the truth uh, would, uh, would ever send out. Thank you. Mr. Taylor from Mississippi, have five minutes. Like to remind everyone that these witnesses, as have all the witnesses, have been chosen by those who seek to discredit the ATF. Having said that, I will now ask the same question that I've asked every panel. Has anything that you have seen, heard, or read justify the murder of four ATF agents and the wounding of 20 more by David Koresh and his followers? Since you have been chosen by those who seek to discredit the ATF, Please feel free to answer this. Could I, only say one, could I only say one thing? I hope I wasn't chosen by someone who seeks to de discredit ATF because and I, the law enforcement could, community. Because I, you know, I love a lot of those people still, and they're they're my great friends. But I, I and, and I would hope that, that certainly many of us here would agree that uh, we hope that uh, this is not part of uh, any casual comments. Go ahead. But anyway, uh, nothing could ever justify that period. Ms. Simpson. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. No, I, uh, I am also not here uh, at the suggestion of the National Rifle Association, as far as I know. And, and certainly, I don't think it was, it was proper for, for ATF agents to be shot at. Thanks. Ms. Call you. No, nothing would justify that, Congressman. Certainly not. Ms. Thank you. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since Ms. Thurman was kind enough early on to give me the opportunity to try to subpoena those people who can paint a true picture of the events leading to the arrest, uh, and unsuccessful because the majority voted against it, I now yield my time back to Ms. Thurman. Mr. Gates, let me ask you something. Last night, one of our witnesses who had been involved with the CSA, which was the, I guess, uh, similar situation in Arkansas, correct? You were there then at that particular time, so you had had some experience with a situation like this, heavily armed, kind of dangerous. Quickly, was there a report done on that particular incident? 
Well, I, I think there probably was, but I don't know, I don't know where we'd find it. But there, I'm sure there was an act after action or, or review report okay. done on that. Okay. The reason I ask that is, is really based on a, a comment that Secretary Benson made. And that was in the fact that in the report that has been written, which I know you somewhat disagree with, but there was <coughs> several mentions of um, the ingredients of what would make a good uh, plan or raid as versus what might not. And it talks about intelligence gathering. It talks about the homework. There was a section in here that talked about um, the, weak, the weak link in the investigation was the undercover house, such. And then it goes on to say that this designation meant that ATF's headquarters would automatically begin monitoring its progress. And surprisingly, there was little input or direction from above which leads me to believe that kind of the higher, but you, but you said, I believe, to one other answer, that you really wouldn't have had much contact with that, that they didn't need to come to you for everything. Is that correct? Well, I don't believe, and, I, and most people in the ATF probably share, that the, the source of all wisdom is in headquarters, that we had some of our best planners happen to be in this area and assisted in the plan, but that's, that may be a part of the report I don't agree with. I don't agree that there wasn't oversight. I think Mr. Harden and others were actively involved in helping come up with a plan that they thought would work. But, but they talked about the poor case management and such within the report. And, and I'm not trying to leave, I'm just trying to get to something here. Because part of what this hearing is supposed to be about is for this never to take place again. So to get to that and to, to look at those things. Secretary Benson, you made a very outstanding remark, I thought, based on something that Mr. Higgins had said, that that had changed. Can you tell us, this committee, what you believe, based on the report and the suggestions it's made, that you as Secretary, what changes you made that you believe better prepare us now if a situation like this should come up again? Well, we've established a very direct communication uh, by the Assistant Secretary of Enforcement uh, with the agencies under his purview, under his jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, this situation of, of not having to come to Treasury or to the supervisors, in effect, uh, when they have such a raid, particularly anything of this magnitude, what was sent to Treasury, I thought, was something more to be able to respond to press inquiries. That's the way it started. But Mr. Higgins has testified that for 11 years they felt that they did not have uh, a legal obligation to have things cleared by Treasury. And I think he's right on that. Uh, we certainly changed that one. Now that has to be done. Is that all the... No, I have some more detail I'll be happy to put into the record at some point. If that is okay with this committee, because I think, Mr. Chairman, that that is a very important part I'd of this. I'd be happy to do that. That we have a without, report without that there objection. have been changes made and that, that the Secretary has, in fact, taken into account what was already looked at. Without Thank objection. You. Okay. Mr. Ehrlich from Maryland, five minutes. And then we're going to break for a uh, series of votes, a 15-minute vote and three five-minute votes. We'll recess and come back here five minutes after the last vote. Mr. Ehrlich, Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my intention to yield to Mr. McCollum from Florida, but before I do, I, I would just like to reiterate a point that's been made by many of my colleagues today. You all know about the spin control, each party, and the fact that this is a very popular sport in Washington, and it appears to be anyway, and photo ops and all that. Many of us on both sides of the aisle, particularly on this side of the aisle, are interested in facts and conclusions therefrom. And just, just for the record, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to share a source of frustration. Uh, it appears from the testimony we received to date that ATF knew this was not a drug case. That seems to be a fact. There was no evidence of, of uh, drug use with respect from uh, evidence from undercover personnel. There was nothing in the affidavit concerning drug use. The dynamic entry used was 180 degrees removed from the kind of entry you would expect if a meth lab was under investigation, etc. Second fact is that the military was used. The military was used with respect to this raid. Army Special Forces Command spent three days training ATF agents for the raid. Uh, National Guard 
planes were used, helicopters, etc. They are two, in my view, irrefutable facts. I read in the paper today, it's kind of interesting, uh, concerning testimony to, uh, with respect to the first two days of this hearing, that the GOP was rebuffed in their attempt to show ATF misled the military in order to receive military support. That is a source of frustration. We're not here to spin, but we are here to tell the American people and to inform the American people about facts concerning this incident, and the American people can make up their own mind. And with that, I will yield to Mr. McCollum. Yielding. I've got a couple of quick questions, particularly for Mr. Simpson to start with. Mr. Simpson, uh, did you talk to anybody besides Mr. Higgins when you were making the decision? I mean, anybody at, on, in the line besides Mr. Higgins when you were making the decision to go ahead with this raid after you'd first canceled it and then said, I'm going to you know, come back and do it anyway? Uh, I, I had been talking to Mr. Noble and... Oh, and I meant like in the line, like Mr. Hartnett or no, any sir. of the other officers. You just talked directly with Mr. Higgins, right? That's, that's correct, sir. Uh, did you at any time in giving uh, uh, instructions, or I don't even know if you gave instructions, did you say to Mr. Higgins that under no circumstances do you go ahead with this raid if the element of surprise is lost? Um, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Higgins gave us certain assurances, one of which was that there was an informant inside the compound who would be able to let the team leaders know if anything had changed. Uh, and, and we understood from that that if there were any changes that jeopardized the success of the raid, it would be called off. But you understand that the Treasury report says that Mr. Higgins, ATF, were instructed by Treasury not to proceed if the element of surprise was lost. You Mr. did McCollum, not actually explicitly make that instruction from what I you did, said. I did not, Mr. McCollum. I, I, I think there may be different views about how explicit that was from the, from the nature of the conversation we had with well, it's Mr. Very, excuse with me, Mr. but it's Higgins. very explicit in the Treasury report, and it doesn't sound nearly so explicit from what you're saying. I'm, I'm only sharing with you my recollection, Mr. McCollum. No, I understand. Well, you're the one on, on hand. I'm not trying to criticize you. I'm just trying to express that concern and frustration. Uh, Mr. Kyler, at any time, did you uh, overhear or participate in, in transmitting any instructions that said, don't proceed with this rate if the element of surprise is lost? No, sir, I didn't. Mr. Higgins, uh, uh, what was, did you hear? Did you ever hear any instructions from anybody uh, higher up than you in Treasury, don't proceed with this rate if the element of surprise is lost? Well, in fairness, it's not a yes or no answer. In fairness, the suggestion that since we had somebody in there, we would put the control on that when we had the undercover officer go in, if he saw anything that was abnormal, out of the ordinary, more than just losing But did anybody tell spike. you that? Did anybody say if, if this undercover agent sees anything abnormal, just call us right off right now? Did, they t did Mr. Simpson tell you that? Mr. Simpson didn't tell me that. No, I was I'm Simpson did that. No, I was asking you that. what Treasury told you. No, he didn't did, tell me that. Did you tell Hartnett that? I told Mr. Hartnett to, have the, to tell the people in uh, Waco Houston, not to go ahead with the raid. The, the orders we were, in, we were operating under was that if the undercover officer saw anything unusual or out of the ordinary, don't go but ahead with the raid. did you say to him, uh, forget the undercover agent for a minute, did you tell him if the element of surprise is lost, get the heck out of Dodge if it's not a surprise? The reason I'm asking that question is because speed and safety are what Mr. Uh, uh, Winoski yesterday said was the, were the considerations and that uh, the question of, of surprise was, was secondary to this process. They, they didn't expect absolute surprise, and nobody told them they couldn't go in if there wasn't surprise. They were interested in, uh, you know, they didn't expect to be ambushed, but surprise was sort of a secondary consideration. Did you tell him, don't go in if you, don't, if you, got, if you get surprised? I went way beyond saying don't go in if you don't get surprised. I said, or if you don't have the element of surprise, because to me, that's a given. You don't do a raid when you're expecting people to be in various parts of the compound. Well, you, you assumed don't... that they would know that. I think that's a safe assumption to make, but yes, I assumed that. But the... you didn't tell them that. All that right, thank time you. time has expired. Uh, we will now recess until five minutes after the last of the series of three or four votes. You know, you can do it otherwise. Yeah. That's our media Yeah. yeah. This is the third day of coverage of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committees. We'll continue testimony in a moment, but first some program information. 
Coming up this weekend on C-SPAN. Saturday on America and the Courts, we mark the five-year anniversary of Justice William Brennan's retirement, with speeches by Justice Brennan and comments by his law clerks. Also Saturday, a review of the Persian Gulf War. Former Bush administration officials James Baker, Dick Cheney, and Brent Scowcroft speak about what they learned from the war. Next, Peacemaking, a speech by Washington Post columnist Coleman McCarthy at Georgetown University. Sunday on Book Notes, House Speaker Newt Gingrich in his book, To Renew America. Our public affairs programming continues this weekend with America and the Courts, Saturday at 7. Then a review of the Persian Gulf War at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Also Saturday night, a speech by columnist Coleman McCarthy at 9 Eastern and Pacific Time. Sunday night, Book Notes with Newt Gingrich at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Our companion network, C-SPAN 2, welcomes over 4,400 new subscribers at TCI Cable of Mexico, Missouri. TCI joins cable companies all across the country, adding C-SPAN 2 to their systems. Our companion network's public affairs programs and live Senate coverage can now be viewed by 39 million cable television subscribers. We continue now with the third day of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committee. This part of the hearing runs about an hour and 15 minutes. can do it in time to allow you to catch your plane. We'll do our best. Okay. Well, we'll definitely get you out of here by then. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, Mr. Heineman, Chair uh, yields to you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to at this time congratulate the gentlelady from Houston, Texas, for her line of questioning. It was, it was like a f breath of fresh air to hear that coming from the other side. And I'd like to direct my, my attention and your attention to something that I started yesterday with a different panel and will pick up today, uh, Mr. Kyler. Um, again, referring to your inter-office memorandum to Mr. Langan. Um, where did you get the information to prepare this? I got it from a briefing I attended on February 11th, and then from talking with the various division chiefs in our headquarters. When it, but it does indicate in here that there's a well-reasoned comprehensive plan that has been approved, which allows for all contingencies. Is that an inaccurate characterization? I don't believe it is. I don't believe it's inaccurate. That was my uh, belief at the time that I prepared this. I don't believe it's inaccurate either. For an operation this, this large, which, according to this plan here, indicates that INS will participate and the military will participate. And being in law enforcement for 38 years at all levels, I know what you have to do to conduct a raid, especially something of this size. You can't, you can't possibly sit down and plan without having a, a, a documented plan especially when you have to deal with the hierarchy, and in this case, in Washington, D.C. And it's like chasing grasshoppers. I've been looking to get someone to say, yes, there was a plan. But here in the book, it says that uh, it says the plan was never committed to paper in any detailed form. I don't believe that. Um, and I'm not attributing that remark to you. Um, but but when, it comes to, when it comes to trying to identify who's responsible for what, I find it very difficult, especially when I hear today that the administrative review of, of Sabrin and Hajnaki relative to being reinstated was, was, um, was, was, was destroyed. Is anyone here at this panel familiar with the personnel, personnel policies of the federal government, disciplinary personnel policies of the federal government? 
relative to the a personnel act of, about disciplinary matters? I am not familiar, Congressman. Can, tell, can anyone tell me that personnel... Let me, let me comment on that. I've been handed yes, this. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what it states. The ATF did not seek destruction of any records related to the personnel action. Copies of all of the evidence has been preserved and submitted to the subcommittees. Copies of the entire official disciplinary file were provided to the subcommittee on July the 7th. During settlement negotiations, counsel to the employees sought the removal of references to the disciplinary actions from certain other personnel files. The agreements have been implemented in a fashion that is entirely consistent with the requirements of the Office of Personnel Management Directives. Okay, you can stop Copies there, Mr. Of Secretary. All expunged I'm, huh? I'm, thank you for your, your enlightening me. I think that uh, I think it's very important that that we know that personnel records were not destroyed, um, and the fact that uh, in fact that there's probably current litigation or pending litigation or thought to. Uh, to criminal actions relative to um, the two supervisors, and I'm not commenting on that. Uh, I agree with Mr. Simpson, the, uh, uh, Mr. Higgins, they probably should not have been fired in the first place. Uh, administrative sanctions could very well do, unless we knew that they intended to the results. But the, um, the, the, the enormity of the plan, the fact that there were 75 to, to 80 agents involved in this. Were there any, was there any representative of higher authority down at the raid site from Washington, D.C. At, at the time of the raid? I believe there was, but I'm not sure who from the headquarters office was there. I think some of the panel members and maybe uh, the next panel of ATF people would be able to provide you the name or, or it can be provided to the committee. I don't know uh, from my knowledge or remember who that was. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was testified here to on the first day by, by a, an author of, of, of a book or a, or a periodical, and I'm not quite sure which one it was, that uh, Hajnaki and, and Sarabin kept their mouth shut. Now, I don't know how to, how to take that as it relates to their disciplinary matters. Uh, do you have any idea what that may have referred to? No, I don't. Under the, uh, only they're under the same restrictions as other ATF employees, and that is uh, they're not to discuss this with anybody who doesn't have a right to know. So whether or not they would discuss it, for example, with an author of a book, I doubt that. In fact, I'm pretty sure they would not. If that's what he had reference to, I think that was entirely proper to, quote, keep their mouth shut. I, I think they were being reasonable. Okay. I'll yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair yields Mr. Bryant, Tennessee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Higgins, uh, we, uh, as you may or may not know, I was a United States attorney uh, during the Bush administration and as such served at the same time uh, that you served as the director of the ATF. And of course, Mr. Barr also was U.S. attorney uh, in Georgia. So we have worked uh, together for the same administration at various times. Uh, I wanted to ask you, of course, it was brought out in an earlier examination that you were initially appointed as the ATF director by President Reagan. Is that correct? Actually, by the Secretary of Treasury during Reagan's term. During the Reagan term, and mm -hmm. then you carried over through the, the, the Bush administration. Yes, but I'd also like to point out I had 32 years in ATF. I started as, a, as an ATF employee on the bottom, so I'm not a, I don't consider myself to be a, quote, political appointee. Okay. In the structure, within the structure of the Treasury Department, would you tell me ultimately uh, where the buck stops type? Who is your boss there at that level? Would that be the Secretary? Yeah, I think the buck stops with me, but I, but I also, if my immediate uh, supervisor at the time of the raid would have been John Simpson, uh, the immediate supervisor for the position. I believe they've changed the titles, but I think it's now the Undersecretary of, of Treasury for Enforcement. And beyond Mr. Simpson was whom in the structure? Would have been the Deputy Secretary and then the Secretary. No. Okay, now Mr. Simpson was acting at, uh, at, at that point. That's correct. And Mr. Nobles... Nobles ultimately took that position. That's correct. He was a designee, I believe, at that point. And Mr. Altman was the deputy? Correct. And then, of course, uh, uh, Secretary Benson right. was in that position. 
and I believe there's been testimony that he was there since about the inauguration around July, uh, January the 20th, maybe some days later, about a month though. Correct. And had Mr. Altman been there about a month or so? I'm not the best person to ask that. As Mr. Secretary probably knows the answer to that. Now, when I say about a month, I'm referring to the date of the raid in February the 28th. I, I think that's probably about right. I just don't remember when Mr. Alton came. Uh, had, when did you first meet with uh, the Secretary to discuss anything about your agency, the ATF? I don't remember any briefings with uh, the Secretary. I haven't gone back to look at my documents. I, Probably in that first month, month and a half, I don't remember any meetings with him. The only interaction we really had during the transition would have been with Mr. Simpson. Are you saying that you never had met with Secretary Benson prior to this raid? I didn't, I didn't go back and look to see, but I, I knew him very little at that point, and I, I can't remember having gone to a staff meeting uh, while he was there. There were informal staff meetings from time to time, but I, I don't remember specifically today having been at one with him. Had you ever met with his deputy, Mr. Altman, before this raid? I don't believe I knew Mr. Altman until then. I knew who he was, obviously. Well, no, I'm a little confused here. <laughs> uh, you're saying that you, you, uh, you were the director of, of the ATF, which we all know is a very significant, powerful element of the Department of Treasury, and you had not met with your ultimate boss, the secretary, uh, for, thir for the 30 days or so? I don't believe so, other than maybe to, to shake hands, and I don't even re remember doing that. Uh, it's interesting that th those who think there's some giant conspiracy in the government <laughs> don't realize how little we knew each other, but uh, uh, I don't remember doing more than shaking hands if we did that. Who, who was within the organizational structure, who was the highest person you had met and talked with? Uh, I talked with Mr. Simpson a lot. He was the highest person. That's generally the way things work. We were right in the middle of a new, of a new uh, transition, and this was probably within the first month. month was there any process or procedure available to you as the director of the ATF to, to brief either the deputy or the secretary? I, I could have called it, uh, them and said, yeah, I'd like to brief you on something. I think they were accessible, yes. But there was no routine process. This was not regularly done at that point. No routine process, although most secretaries at some point get up a set up a system where there's a regular either every week or every two week meeting with bureau heads. Uh, at this point, I would yield back to uh, Mr. Uh, McCollum or Mr. Zellick if they have any questions. If you, you, you yield to me? Either. Yes. Well, I just uh, want to ask one question uh, very quickly of all of this. I wonder, uh, Mr. Higgins, if you could tell us if at any time during this process, and for that matter also, uh, uh, Mr. Kyler and, and Mr. Simpson, maybe you could respond too. Did Mr. Hartnett or, or anyone in ATF discuss at the level of Mr. Simpson uh, or, or anyone in that range between you and Mr. Simpson and Mr. Higgins the efforts or to arrest David Koresh off the compound uh, as a separate and apart from the, the arrest effort at the compound and the search that day? The day that I approved the plan within ATF, and I believe that was February the 12th, uh, the first question I asked when presented the plan was, why don't we just arrest him somewhere away from the premise? The first question I asked, and that led into a long discussion about the things that they had looked into doing uh, and the reasons they had concluded that it wasn't, it wasn't going to work, it couldn't be successful, and so now we were down to the remaining options. So, yes, it was discussed Simpson, then. Yes, sir. Could Mr. Simpson and Mr. Kyler respond as to whether that question was ever discussed with you by Mr. Higgins or you knew about that or that issue came up as a discussion point? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman, there was no discussion of that. Mr. Kyler? No, there was no discussion with me on that. Thank you. Fired. Uh, Mr. Satter, you recognize for five minutes. Gentleman in Indiana. I yield <clears throat> two and a half minutes to Mr. Barr. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Langan, if I could uh, direct your attention to one of the documents that I certainly <laughs> hope you have before you there. Uh, dated 14 April 93, Treasury Interoffice Memorandum uh, directed to you and to Mr. Simpson. I don't have document that document. Document number 18994. May I have a copy of Let's it, please? Let's get another copy out. we will run out of copies soon. This is, uh, while that is uh, being distributed, <laughs> this is a memorandum from uh, Robert McNamara dated April 14, 1993 to John P. Simpson and uh, Michael D. Langan. As a matter of fact, Mr. Simpson, maybe you could, you got one there? Okay. 
Uh, and you're familiar with the discussion that we had earlier about uh, policies and procedures and what was uh, attempted to be done in terms of ATF conducting its shooting review. Uh, and uh, then uh, <coughs> these documents start coming out uh, directing that the interview cease and that no records be, uh, be taken, no notes be taken, and so forth. Uh, in your opinion, uh, is that uh, the appropriate procedure uh, to be followed if uh, there is an effort made to uh, determine what happened in the shooting incident, uh, to gather the very best evidence possible while uh, evidence and uh, the situations are fresh in people's minds and to accumulate the data that is necessary in order to form an objective opinion as to whether or not something went wrong. Is this, is this uh, memo consistent with that? Well, it's the normal process of the bureaus whenever well, it, there's... It, it, but for answer first and then explain. I mean, is if maybe we have a disagreement over what is the purpose of a shooting review. Is, am I wrong in presuming that the shooting review, based on testimony we heard yesterday, is in fact a search to obtain uh, data to determine what happened, what went wrong, if anything, so that... That, that is what a shooting made. review is. Okay. Uh, then is our directives coming from the Department of Justice lawyers or the Department of Treasury lawyers directing that interviews cease, that no further evidence be gathered, uh, consistent with that objective? I think it's consistent if there's an overriding interest. Something other than a search for the truth. No, I didn't say that. I think that... Uh, well, we've determined that that, uh, that that is the purpose of the review, and, and I'm saying that they were trying to do the right thing. And I would think that the Department of Justice, rather than sending out memos directing that interviews cease and the witnesses not be interviewed and that notes not be taken, would be doing quite the opposite. And I'm curious as to why they, they're taking this tack. I was the receiver of the memo, and I can only uh, surmise that the Department of Justice had good reason for uh, wanting to be sure that criminal trials proceeding didn't uh, become compromised because of... Uh, <laughs> because of activity that uh, would have been unhelpful. Well, uh, I'm not sure how far we'll get here, but this, this is, is it your experience that these memos came out every time there was a shooting review that took place? No. Okay, was there anything extraordinary about, about this situation uh, other than the fact that it was a very large raid and people died that would lead you to the conclusion well, that the investigation enough. This, should, this be, should be curtailed? That was extraordinary enough. This was an, uh, an awful tragedy, and I think that they were making every uh, effort to exercise precautions to make certain that... Uh, that people were not interviewed. No, to make, well, that, to that's make what that, certain that's what that this directs. Trials I, I'm sorry, I better you back some of my time, uh, or Mr. Uh, Souter's time back to him. The balance does not appear to be very much. Uh, Secretary, Secretary Benson, let me thank you very much for being here and for your service to the nation. Let me then turn to a separate theme, and it is this notion that we're being beaten with over our head every single day, and that is that these hearings have no purpose, that they are a waste of time, and that no new evidence has come out. Absolutely nothing further could be true, from the truth could be true. In point of fact, a tremendous amount of new information has come out as a result of these hearings, just as it should in an oversight proceeding. But it is important to point out that, it, that the, uh, the implication here is that because David Koresh was evil, we should not be conducting these hearings. That is an outrageous charge. You, Mr. Secretary, conducted a review, a review that is in this book, an important book to the American people, but a book that these hearings have revealed is only 70% accurate. It oh, seems oh, to I me... I don't agree with that one at all. By, according to their testimony of the agents who I understand. Who one of them who was dismissed... Uh, I understand made that kind of a statement. I can understand uh, their criticism of something uh, where they uh, have been found uh, erring in their responsibilities and have been disciplined. I can understand that. The point being that the uh, I must tell you that in addition to that, that we have all kinds of comments, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the rest of it, uh, talking about uh, the extensiveness, the detail, uh, the amount of work that was done in this regard. The point is that we have an oversight obligation. The ends do not justify the means. The fact that Mr. Koresh may have been evil does not mean we do not have an oversight obligation. And the day in America when we refuse to look into the conduct of law enforcement agencies because in the end they went after a bad person is the day in America when tyranny rules. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Chair yields to Mr. McCollum for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I get to claim my own time now. I want to follow up one thing with you, Mr. Higgins, before I go on. Uh, you, a moment ago, you told me that uh, you did have a discussion. Was it with Mr. Hartnett about arresting David Koresh off the compound? It was with uh, Mr. Hartnett and the other, the actual the, the members who had planned the raid. I believe the case agent and his supervisor were there. So there, it was a, a discussion with, a, with and, a number of staff. And when was that? That was, I think, on February the 12th. I believe the, the briefing for Mr. Hartnett was on the 11th, and then I came down on the 12th to either approve or disapprove the plan. And you said you instructed them or encouraged them, or what were your words that you told them to, to try to get him off the compound? Well, no, the first question I asked when they presented me with the option of the surprise entry was, why aren't we doing more? Why don't we try to catch him away? Because that's generally what we prefer in a situation like that. And that's when they described to me the efforts they had made to initially try to do that and were unsuccessful, and then they felt like simply that that, that option was no longer a viable one, and that's why they were rec recommending this other option. And you didn't question them any further about ruses they might have tried to get him off or what else they might have done or encouraged to get Wasn't that important to you, Mr. Higgins, that if he could have been captured at all away from that compound, wouldn't that have been highly desirable in order to get him away from the, the rest of the group that was there? It, it was important to me. Uh, whether I ask enough, uh, you know, in hindsight, you, I could never have asked enough, but I, it was important to me. There were also other elements that they explained to me about if you catch him off the, off the compound, you still have the question of finding whether well, or not he destroys Well, that's the, a very important question. Yeah. Did you walk away from those meetings, leaving them with the impression that it wasn't that important that they catch him off the compound? In fact, it might be better if he were still there and that they served the warrant while he was in there. I can't get to the bottom of that with them so far, and I'm curious about you. What was the policy? Were they to try to get him off the compound all the way up to the day of the raid, or was that discarded on the 12th of February? I think on the 12th of February uh, it, that had been discarded because the decision on the, on the 12th of February was to uh, go with the entry plan that uh, ultimately was tried and did not work. All right. Do you, were you aware, Mr. Higgins, when all of this, when this raid took place, that the undercover agents had an undercover house that had been operated for some time? Yes. And were you aware that that undercover house uh, had, had they had video uh, uh, reviews of what was going on at the compound, that photographs had been taken, and that at the time the decisions you were making with them on the raid, just, just preceding February 28th with Mr. Simpson, that those videos and a lot of those photographs uh, had never been reviewed, never been looked at by anybody uh, of responsibility underneath you. Were you aware of all of that? No, I was not aware were of that. You aware, fact, you're telling were you, me something were new. Were you aware, Mr. Higgins, that, that uh, Mr. Gonzalez, who was the undercover agent who had been in there, uh, was posing supposedly as a trade school student, as were all the others in the undercover house, but that they were driving new cars, they had pretty good clothes on, they were about 40, 30 or 40 years of age, they didn't look anything like trade school students, uh, and that in fact, uh, uh, that this was not particularly a good uh, operation going on out of there in any respect. I don't have time to go into all the details. Were you familiar with the details of that operation, how they set up the undercover house, not and, all and the quality of all of this? I wasn't familiar with those details. Some of those details don't sound right. I doubt they were there with those expensive cars. And if they, somebody described them with Rolex watches, if they did, they paid $15 for well, them. Well, I didn't say Rolex else. watches, but, but I just meant they, they were 30 or 40 years old and the trade school was the cover and all that. Were you familiar with the details? No, I was not familiar with that detail. Well, you weren't familiar with the details no. of what, how, what kind of the undercover operation was run. I just find it incredible uh, that this operation worked the way it did. I find it incredible, first of all, that we had the assault that went, uh, went on as it did, that raid that day as a dynamic entry, considering the bumbling that went on that we've seen so far with regard to the undercover operation. I think it's incredible that we had the raid that went on as it did without uh, more direct supervision on your part or knowledge that somebody gave you, Mr. Higgins. I find it even more incredible, though, that it appears the Treasury Department, all the way up through the Secretary, uh, really had no more knowledge than they did until as late as they did. And when they did have that knowledge, that it, it never even got to the Secretary, that you hadn't even met him in the time that he'd been in office, or for that matter, his principal deputy. You hadn't even met him as the head of the ATF, the, the law enforcement arm of the Treasury Department. All of this tells me something was really, really amiss, more than the Treasury report has said to us today. They've, they've got some criticisms, some of which aren't valid, some of which are, but they didn't criticize themselves. And somebody was wrong, wrong, wrong up through that process in that organization, it seems to me, in the way Treasury operated. And I can't help but think that it was a possibility was there that lives could have been saved if things had just been different not with the operation. And I don't condone David Koresh, but I don't condone this operation either. I don't condone what I see, and I think it's very understandable why the American public thinks it smells. Thank you. 
By uh, unanimous consent uh, and agreement on both sides of the aisle here, uh, there will be a final five-minute wrap-up on each side. Chair now uh, yields to uh, Jackson Lee from Houston, Texas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, for that, and I uh, thank the, uh, again the gentlelady from uh, New York. Um, Mr. Higgins, uh, I didn't hear you uh, use the term condone. Um, are there all aspects, or did you condone everything that happened that resulted in this tragedy? I, I've listened to the previous questioner uh, question you in an incredulous manner. Did you testify today that you condoned everything that occurred, sir? Well, I think I got to have you stop beating your wife type question, but I thought what he gave was more of a statement, not a question. So, I mean, that's his opinion. I didn't come here did, thinking did I would Did you condone, sir, everything that occurred in, no, in this situation, this tragedy? Absolutely not. So I mean, we made a lot of mistakes. There were problems, and they need to be corrected. Is that my understanding? Absolutely. Um, let me also ask you, and, and just clarify again, and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, be the lawyer for the state of Texas, but, le but let me understand that you indicated the state of Texas cooperated in terms of a request made uh, by your uh, uh, department. Yes, they did. Uh, let me also ask the question uh, that um, with respect to your line officers uh, and their cooperation with the military, uh, is it my understanding that in terms of what they did uh, that you perceived them to have tried to follow guidelines, regulations. Not saying they did, not saying that they were successful, uh, but in your review, you thought they tried. I think more than tried, I think they did. So when, when I heard today that somebody said they had violated something or had lied, I, I think that's an outrageous allegation. I hope somebody will investigate that because I don't believe they lied. Before we, my time runs out, let me ask you as a professional how you can uh, correct the, the coordinating aspect, FBI, you, and others? And that's my last question. <laughs> you probably don't have enough time for my answer. So I, I, you know, I think that the, that the uh, present Secretary of Treasury is doing a good job improving coordination within so that the kind of things where we don't have those meetings and we'd go that long don't take place. And I think the entire community is working closely. And we can improve on that. And I thank Absolutely. you, Ms. Uh, I'd like to yield my remaining time to the gentlelady from New York. Thank you very much. Reiterated that uh, we've had testimony here that in previous actions by the BATF they had no connection with the top levels of the Treasury Department. Is that correct? This was not unusual, and that indeed Secretary Benson, as Secretary of Treasury, has changed that now. That's Isn't correct. that correct? That's correct. Um, one of the other uh, things that continually is, is said here is talking about how much better it would have been to arrest Koresh off the compound. I frankly am surprised that anybody would ever even have considered that. You did understand that he had a group of followers who would do anything for him, the Lamb of God, that if anything were to happen to him, that you would have some serious troubles on your hands. In addition, I understand that it is much better if you want to examine a premises, that you want to serve a search warrant at that premises so that no one has an opportunity to destroy the evidence that you're going in after. Isn't that correct? What possible gain would you have had in this action to have arrested Mr. Koresh off the premises of that compound? What would that have gotten for you? We would have still had the difficult job of, of serving the search warrants and, and with them knowing we were coming even, it would have been a dangerous situation at Do best. you believe it would have been safer for BATF agents than to walk up to that door after you had Mr. Koresh in custody? It had been a lot safer for them in theory, I think in practice, no, because I think there were a lot of people in there who were violent. He didn't fire all the shots that day, so Correct. I think we would have still and had the same problem. did you not have an understanding, Mr. Higgins? Did, was there not a complete understanding, I hope, by the BATF agents that this was a group you'd had enough contact with them, and I know Mrs. Sparks did, to understand that Mr. Koresh's followers were trained precisely to protect him and that even little children were known from the day they were brought in there that Armageddon was coming. That the Babylonians, I believe, were coming. So when you Babylonians walked up to the door, is there some reason to believe that if Koresh was in a county jail somewhere, that you would have been one iota safer? Not at all. I, you know, I really hope that, that can, we can nail that down on this hearing, because this continually comes up. 
that he could have been taken somewhere else and avoided all this. I don't think there's one scintilla of evidence of that, and I certainly want that on the record, and I hope you will all agree in this last moment. Do you all agree with that? Yes, ma'am. All, right, all, Mr. Langan, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hyde, for three minutes, followed by Mr. Boyer for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm trying to nail something down that, that I started to get into this morning. Um, I read from an article that said two unmarked cattle trailers drew up in front of the buildings at Mount Carmel and disgorged more than 70 agents dressed in dark commando costumes, complete with ski masks and carrying guns. And I was told that there were no ski masks. And I'd like to know from somebody who has knowledge whether they wore headgear. If it wasn't a ski mask, was it one of those Darth Vader riot helmets? Did they have something on their faces, Mr. Higgins? I'm sure they were wearing Kevlar helmets for their protection, and had they not have been, we probably would have oh, lost Oh, I'm all for people. it. I'm just trying to get the yes, picture. The Ke Kevlar helmets, which would yeah. help protect them I'm while they're there. I'm familiar with serving subpoenas right. and serving uh, warrants, and usually a couple of deputy sheriffs walk up, but when two flatbed trucks uh, disgorge 70 people with uh, Darth Vader or whatever you, uh, you know, it's kind of, they call ballistic missile defense Star Wars, I'll call this Darth Vader with, uh, with commando uniforms on. It's a little, a little, create a little apprehension, especially if you believe the forces of Babylon are coming for you. I, I would think they were here if when I saw that. So I'm just trying to nail that down. Okay, now, uh, Secretary Benson, this memo of April 15th uh, from Roger Altman to you, uh, in reading it, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting. It's, it says, Ron Noble informed me that, that the AG is weighing a request from the FBI to use an advanced form of tear gas on the compound. Among other things, this gas doesn't dissipate. Now, in the last paragraph, it says, my rough guess is she won't, meaning the AG, okay this. The risks of a tragedy are there. And if the FBI waits indefinitely, Mr. Koresh eventually will concede. Now, my question to you, Mr. Secretary, is when you got this, I understand that the next call was Janet Reno's, not yours. That was outside your purview. That was her decision. We know that. But did you think enough of the information in here to call somebody at the White House and discuss it with them? Did you choose to weigh in and give them the benefit of your sagacity on a thing like this? Or did you just say, hey, it's her? It's Mr. Her, it's Chairman, her we had been very much involved in the process. And obviously, some mistakes had been made uh, by the ATF, uh, sincere mistakes, but mistakes in judgment. At this point, we were not in the decision-making at all. Uh, it was now totally under the FBI and under the Department of Justice. And that's where it was. And that's where we left it. And I was assured, I mean, no, that those things had been given consideration by them. And they had obviously conferred with experts in that regard. Let me make one other comment. Uh, the statement uh, was made earlier uh, that in this report that we did not criticize ourselves. That's not correct. M Mr. Chairman, I don't want my time. I don't well, want to foreclose. But at I some point, I should, you, be, I I should be allowed to time. answer some of the charges that were made in that. All right. But I, d I didn't make it. I, I agree. Go I, ahead, I, I, Go I'm ahead. just simply trying to find out then. You, you did not, after reading this document, weigh in with anybody. You just put it aside and said it's up to Janet Reno, Gentlemen, right? That was her jurisdiction, we know that. her responsibility. So, so you did and not... And I went on with my other responsibilities. Right, you did not mine. call me. One last little comment. It, it seems to me that your agencies, a, ATF and for that matter the CIA, have a problem getting rid of people that ought to be fired. You can't fire them. The EEOC makes you take them back, you can maybe demote them, but getting rid of people who have screwed up and, and, and cost maybe lives even, which happened here, you really have a problem um, 
getting rid of them, don't you? Mr. Chairman, they were demoted. They resigned. Some of them uh, were given totally different responsibilities. Uh, action was taken, substantial action. And, and how many stayed on the payroll who were disciplined? Uh, let's see. Those that appealed to the uh, Merit uh, Appeal Board uh, stayed on the payroll. They were, their badges were taken off of them, their guns were taken off of them, and their responsibilities were changed substantially. But everybody who appealed stayed on, right? Two. There were, not, there were two. Thank you. That's right. Mr. Chairman, Thank you. I, I know Mr. Hyde ended up taking my two minutes, and I would dare ever uh, say that under the, under the great chairman, but could I ask unanimous consent, not for two minutes, but for, just for one minute? Okay. All right. Th thank you. Thank you, Without Mr. Without objection, so ordered. I, I just have uh, uh, one question to you, Mr. Higgins. Yesterday we went over go, no-go procedures. What, is it true that the code word for the go procedure was showtime? Is that true? What? You had the people here yesterday who knew what that were. I don't, I don't know what it was. All right. Would you look into that for me and let me know to tell me if, that, if it really was showtime? I find that pretty uh, offensive. The, the great thing I thought about retirement is that those are their problems now, but I'll, I'll ask somebody to do that. Okay? Those are their problems. <laughs> well, good try. That, that does come under your, under I think, your kind I think of responsibility. I think time has now expired, short and sweet. Um, All right. I was certainly in, in the interest of fairness. Okay. I just have one question. I know there are many people that have more questions for you, Mr. Higgins. Is there any chance that you'd be willing to join the panel on Monday morning at 9.30? I'm supposed to be working for a living on Monday, and, I'm, and I've had a long-standing thing to do it. No, I, if some other time, fine, but I'm, I'm going to be gone until probably Tuesday oh, mid-afternoon. That's fair. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, all members of the panel. Uh, we thank you very much. It's been a long morning. We appreciate your input. We hope, uh, as you all do, I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. Thank you. This panel would please leave, and the next panel will start proceeding to the table. Next uh, subcommittee, uh, the next uh, panel, please come forward. I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I will start to introduce them. We'll start to introduce them. Uh, it'll be to my left, your right, Joyce Sparks, Texas Department of Child Protective Services, George Morrison, Los Angeles Police Department, Tim Evans, attorney, John Coleman, formerly with Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Victor Aboyski, President, Law Enforcement Officers Association. <laughs>
All members of the panel here? It's customary that the uh, witnesses uh, be sworn in to the subcommittees. If you'll all stand and raise your right hand. Testimony you're about to give to these subcommittee, subcommittees, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I heard a affirmative action, affirmative uh, answer to from all members of the panel. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield my five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Sparks, I understand you have had conversations with a Fran Hagen, who I guess is with the NRA. This was not part of our committee investigation, and I'm sorry that someone falsely represented themselves to you. Will your testimony today at all be influenced in any way by those conversations and things that you wouldn't have said otherwise? No. Thank you very much. I also want to state for the record that our job in this committee is an oversight fu function of the federal agencies and we don't have jurisdiction over child abuse cases and that um, regardless of how repulsive and wicked an individual is, and I can't see that I've read of anybody much worse than David Koresh, we don't have jurisdiction over that. But let me tell you anyway, uh, on behalf of many of us, that we're pleased with your dedicated commitment to those children. You persisted in that case. Uh, one of the frustrating things in child abuse is that many people, such as the mothers in this case and others, apparently uh, would not grant you interviews. They would not file charges. It's one of the most difficult things in the protection of children is that you can't go forth with many of these cases unless somebody will come to you and be willing to go to uh, trial. Uh, it also appears that at least you're alleging that local law enforcement agencies you feel were tipping them off that you were coming, which is uh, not a regular problem, but a problem we have around the country with people uh, doing that. I also read in, in your testimony that even Carrie Jewell, who was so brave here the other day, uh, wouldn't uh, testify, which is no fault against her, but shows how hard it is to pursue such cases. And I wanted to make sure that was in the record because I've worked many years on the child abuse issue and I am very, uh, I find the whole thing repulsive, the man repulsive, uh, based on what we've seen, but that is not what we're, we're doing here. And what I would do is, would like to do is ask you a few questions related to the raid. Could you describe how you felt about the raid and was the government considering the best interests of the children when they went in? I personally think the raid was a mistake. I've been pretty opinionated about that. Um, once, once the raid started, um, the fire was inevitable. Um, it set into motion what he would construe as the fulfilling of his prophecy. Um, so once that happened, children were going to die. There's a quote, but in the end, the last comment I heard, I had from Janet Rito is when I said, now I want you to tell me once more why you believe we should move now rather than wait some more. And she said, it's because of the children. Do you think that that is a fair statement? Well, we, we recovered an arsenal of weapons, but we lost 20 children. I'd say there's a flaw in that plan. That was, by the way, a statement from President Clinton. You said in your uh, testimony that when you saw the ladders and you saw the raid occurring, you knew the children were going to die. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, what evidences and what had you heard that led you to believe, can you elaborate a little further why you believe that this type of raid would result in the death of the children? Well, I talked with David Koresh many times. Um, and initially in my investigation, um, I tried to keep the biblical um, references that he continued to want to give separate from my, from my investigation. Um, he repeatedly told me that you can't understand me unless you understand what I believe. And I came to understand that. Um, so I started watching how his beliefs manifested in his actions. And uh, it was real clear that, that uh, I mean, he said that the enemy will surround the camp and the saints will die. And that was, that was real clear. There will be blood and fire and explosion at the end. 
Um, and he believed that, and the people that, he, that followed him believed it as well. So once you set in motion the enemy surrounding the camp, um, he and his followers would have believed that that was the end time. If there had been longer time before they had gone in with the raid, do you believe more of his non-biological children could have been uh, released? No. You believe the, those that were in there, uh, regardless of what happened, were going to be uh, remaining in there? I, I think that at first I thought, well, maybe something's going to happen. And then as I saw that it was not his biological children coming out, uh, he believed that to be, you know, you had to be with him at the last days. Um, and so he was sending out, probably as a delaying tactic, the other children. And those were all out by, by the end, um, except his biological? Every, every child who came out was not one of his biological children. But were there any non-biological? Has expired. Sorry. Uh, Mrs. Thurman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Dr. Sparks. We're glad you're here today. Um, on Wednesday, we heard some testimony from Carrie Jewell, and I've understood that you have talked with Carrie as well over, I guess, when she was down in Texas. Yes. Um, she talked about her molestation. Did his religious philosophy include having sex with minors? He never said that to me. He was very cautious. But um, I, I did my homework. I studied when he asked me to. And Psalms 45 was real, a real uh, important psalm to him. And it's the wedding psalm. And so he, would, he was much too smart to tell me that he was doing that. But all of his teachings uh, said that that was okay. So he did biblical references for all of his actions? There are a lot of actions. references in the Old Testament that would lead one to believe that it's okay. How often or for how long did you stay in contact with Mr. Koresh? Um, I, my initial contact be began in February of 92. And um, probably the last conversation I had was about December. Uh, of 92. You've worked, it's my understanding, for over 16 years in the Child Protective Services. Is that That's correct? correct? Okay. Were you concerned um, about the safety of the young girls after hearing some of these religious views? Yes. Very concerned. Um, they're, they're not just the sexual abuse, but there were other things going on. We knew that uh, Babies were being spanked, uh, but we, we, didn't, we never saw a bruise. So it was real difficult for us to do anything with that. But children were, were telling us things that, that we couldn't pursue because of our uh, limited access. Did, did at any time, did he also talk, because um, you had just mentioned earlier that, that they probably would never come out of there. Did he, in his religious beliefs, talk about that as well? That was consistent. He, he said that this, there would, the, the enemy would surround the camp, and uh, he talked a lot about Babylon and the government being the beast. And uh, one of the things that they were supposed to do was to try to confuse the enemy. And so even when he lied to people, he he thought that was what he was supposed to do. But his plan was there would be blood and fire at the end and uh, everyone would die. The saints would all die. So you, when, when Carrie testified before us, she talked about cyanide and guns and so you kind of, I mean, that kind of goes along with the same thing she had said, that they knew about suicide. When I talked to David, there was an incident where there were some rumors of mass suicide. He was adamant that suicide was not in their plan. But you have to understand that he thought that he was, he was, Christ came and he was the gentle Messiah. He tried to tell us the truth and we didn't listen. And so he thought that he was here as a military uh, intervention. And so that was his position. He thought that he was here to militarily uh, intervene. 
and and that colored a lot of the things that he did. And can and let's do his punishment a little bit here because I know there were some views I think that you yeah. wanted to share with us about his punishments and why he did them and what he thought the reason was for that. He had a very interesting philosophy on disciplining children. And he confirmed that that started at about eight, eight months old. He said that? Yes. And he said that you hold a baby. I said, how do you discipline a baby? And he said, you hold the baby, and if it cries, you say no. And then you look away. And you do that several times, and that's where you start. And then I said, well, you know, what if the child's going to be burned, sticking his hand in the fire? And he said, well, you say no. I told you, don't do that. You'll get hurt. And so I said, well, what if he tries again? And he said, if he tries again, you tell him the same thing. I only tell you the truth. And if you don't listen to me, you're going to get hurt. And he said, then the next time you just let him get burned, and he'll remember. And I said, well, David, I, I, I hear what you're saying. What happens if a child runs in front of a car? You can't just let them do that. And he said, no, but you can get a mutilated cat, and you can show it to the child and say, look, this was what will happen if you don't do what I say. So it was a very threatening thing. With Carrie Jewell, um, she was scared to death that she was telling me and that he might find out. That was one of the reasons she wouldn't testify because she knew that he would be there. And she also knew her mother would be there, is that? Yes, and she, um, she said that she sometimes wondered what it would be like if David was right, and if she was, if his, if his teachings were right. And she thought that she would die and burn in hell for telling. So he had a great hold on those children. It, it was very, it was very difficult to get them to talk, because um, it was very monitored. And that happened to you as well, I think, when you were at the compound and and your when you went in initially to talk to the, to the children, you found that same kind of. Yes, um, we ended up um, interviewing uh, the little boy on the back of a, fl a flatbed trailer outside, and his eyes were darting around. He was clearly frightened. And he was being real careful what he said. When I had a meeting in my office with David Koresh, after, just after that, he knew every question I had asked the child. I mean, he must have sat the child down and just interrogated him to get every single, every single bit of inter information, because then he was explaining everything to me. Sterling, Thank you, Dr. Ms. Ross Layton from Florida. Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield my time to Mr. <clears throat> Souter. I want to make it clear that I hope no one watching this hearing or looking at the record believes that this man Koresh's perverted view of scripture somehow justifies child sexual abuse. Uh, he may have thought it was in, within his religious philosophy, but the Bible also says even the devil can misquote scripture. Uh, with that, I'd like to move to Mr. Evans. My colleague, Congressman Barr from Georgia, introduced a set of memos that originate from the Department of Treasury and concern the tragic events around Waco. <clears throat> Would you tell me what you believe to be the significance of these documents? And they've been circulated to all the members. Yes, thank you very much. I first learned of these documents uh, while I was here observing these hearings two days ago. And I'll have to tell all of you that I was amazed that they existed and shocked at what I saw in them, and I would like to, uh, to go over these uh, with you at this time because I think it takes uh, someone who's involved in the legal system to actually let you know what the importance of these documents is. I was uh, run <coughs> one of the lawyers in the Davidian case in San Antonio. I represented Norman Allison, a British citizen, who was acquitted of all charges, even though he was charged with the same conspiracy to murder federal agents that everyone else was. What is significant about these documents is that <clears throat> there's a theory in the law and in our Constitution, and the Supreme Court endorses it firmly, that the government must reveal to anyone that is accused of a crime in this country 
evidence that is exculpatory, in other words, that might point to their innocence or that might disagree, in other words, show that there is a, uh, two different sides to the story or that the government witnesses are telling two different stories. That's clear, clearly a burden. These documents show that they're, to, to my interpretation of looking at them, uh, they show that there was an effort to keep that uh, from happening and to uh, just abandon that responsibility. I'd ask you uh, first to, to set the stage, we must understand that not one agent who was at the raid on the scene on the 28th made a written report of it. That's highly irregular. We brought that out in the trial. The Texas Rangers testified that it was highly irregular. I've practiced criminal law for 25 years. I've never been in a situation where agents who worked at a, uh, who, who had personal information, who were at a site and observed an incident, certainly one this uh, spectacular and egregious, did not make a written report. We asked at the trial, why didn't you make written reports? Well, we were just told not to and there was going to be uh, uh, a review by the rangers and we wanted this to look like it was an independent, uh, look like an independent investigation. They, they told us that. That was their reason. And now we see these documents, which I have just seen today, that were not revealed to us. And I'll tell you, this is something new that these hearings have brought out. I'll guarantee you that. And let's start with the first one up there, and that's uh, the page... Uh, a page that starts with a memoranda to Ronald K. Noble. And I'll not get to go through all of these at this time, but, but I'll go through this first one to set the stage for what's important. That memorandum from Sarah Elizabeth Jones to Ronald K. Noble was written on March the 1st of 1993. That's the day after the shootings when the ATF did what they always do and all law enforcement agencies do across the country. They started a shooting review team. That's what they should have done. They sent, uh, and that document will say, if you could point to it, March the 1st, well, take that down because I believe we have a blow up of the paragraph that I'm referring to. And it says on March the 1st, the ATF initiates a shooting review. David Troy, Bill Wood interview four agents and their names there. I won't read their names, but four of the first agents. Uh, two of them are supervisors. Troy tells review they immediately determined that these stories did not add up. They immediately determined that these stories did not add up. And if you look in the parentheses down there where it says, note, here was the response to that, note, Johnston, the assistant United States attorney, at this point advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review because ATF was creating Brady material not because they wanted the Rangers to do an independent investigation, but because ATF was creating Brady material. Brady material, ladies and gentlemen, is information that might tend to show that someone accused is innocent. I see my red lights on. Uh, uh, do you, you feel that uh, you've sufficiently answered the question if you have Ten seconds just to wrap it up. I mean, I, I, we don't want to shut you off. But. Well, to be fair with, with you, there are several other documents, and I hope I get a chance to, okay. to, to go through it. And, and no, I have not answered the question, but it will take more than a minute oh, maybe, to do Maybe the, uh, the next uh, gentleman I'm about to introduce will give you time. Uh, Mr. Schumer, you have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it might snow tomorrow also. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Answer, my friend. Right. I'm sure that folks on the other side will want to uh, review your very lawyer-like presentation, Mr. Evans. Now, I have some questions for Dr. Sparks. And Dr. Sparks, I know that you didn't come to uh, Washington to talk about the role of the National Rifle Association in setting up this hearing, but I must ask you about it because I think it's important that we get into the record, the official record, what happened in terms of your interview. So. What I'd like to do is first uh, play, this, play this tape and have you identify it. What's, is there a tape? Yes. This is the tape. Uh, are, you, are you doing wiretaping then? No, we are not doing wiretaping, wiretapping, or anything else. We are simply, this is the tape that we have talked about before in terms of an interview 
uh, a phone message left for Ms. Sparks by a Ms. Fran Hager. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Dan, wait a second. The tape is uh, of a parliamentary inquiry. Okay, state your. Uh, I, I just want to make sure this isn't my time, Mr. Chairman. Every time. Uh, uh, Airside has attempted to do something uh, even somewhat less spectacular than the gentleman from New York always tries. The other side objects to it on uh, parliamentary grounds. No, we haven't. And uh, there was uh, also discussion earlier formed as a parliamentary inquiry that uh, nothing could be distributed or used unless it was shown to the other side, uh, namely, uh, namely them, in advance. So I would object to the introduction of this at this time based on precedence. Ba I'm Regular still talking. Order based on precedence that the other side has already set by way of parliamentary inquiries. Uh, responding... Okay, I, I, just to uh, give me a chance, you, you want to be in the chair? Nope. Okay. Um, I know you do. In two years, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just want to remind you that. Uh, Mr. Barr, I think in, in all due respect, in the sense of fairness, uh, I can remember the CNN tape that we right. had in the beginning. Uh, so I think maybe... To, to which they objected. Well, well, they, they did, and we spent a lot of time, but you're, you're a man of much uh, greater uh, flexibility, I think. So if we can, let's... I, I, think, I think our side generally is, and I appreciate the other side now recognizing that. Thank you for I, I uh, reserve, I remove my objection. Thank you very much. Uh, proceed, Mr. Schumer. Okay. Thank you. Your, time, your clock is ticking. Uh, I'm at 202 543 extension 102. Uh, that's in Washington, D.C., and I expect that this is not exactly the voice that you want to hear on your voicemail uh, this morning. But um, I'm with the Waco hearing uh, team that is working on uh, putting together the um, uh, Waco hearings that are slated to, well, they were slated to begin the 12th of July, but it looks like they're going to be backed off to the 18th. Um, and I was trying to get in touch with you uh, to chat with you uh, about uh, some of your direct knowledge of the uh, things that uh, came down in Waco. Um, if you can get back to me, um, please do. Um, the did you hire her? Hmm. No, unfortunately, the National Rifle Association did. But let's let Dr. Sparks answer the questions, and I will be quick and to the point. Was this message left on your voicemail, Dr. Sparks? First, I need to clear something up. Please. Don't call me doctor. I'm sorry. <laughs> it says doctor over there, Miss Sparks. Wrong, sorry. Apologize. Was this uh, message left on your voicemail, Ms. Sparks? Yes, it was. Uh, did you return Fran Hager's call? Yes, I did. Uh, when you called her back, how did she initially identify herself? She said she was with the Waco team, and she wanted to talk to me about um, what I knew about Waco. Okay. And how did you get her to admit she worked for the NRA? As we talked, uh, something just didn't seem right, and I asked her, what is your role? Tell me what your role in this is, because it seemed to be getting fuzzy to me. Um, she sort of talked around in circles, and finally I said, wait a minute, who pays your salary? And when pressed, she did tell me that it was National Rifles Association. Did you feel deceived by Ms. Hager? Yes. And would you have called her back if initially, when she first played the tape, she identified herself as being from the NRA? No, I wouldn't have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sparks. Um, I just ask, what, what was the point? I mean, well, we will let I, the record. Did I miss something? Yeah, what you meant. Well, I don't think anybody in the audience missed it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, That's not a any, cliche. Okay, no. If you, I don't I mean, want to use my time to elaborate the, the point. Miss Fran Hague at the beginning before. Who is Fran Hague? Fran Hager is a consultant for the National Rifle Association. Do we who, know that? Instead of yes, we do. She admitted it to uh, Ms. Sparks, but when she called Ms. Sparks to interview her, she said, I'm from the Waco, Waco hearing team, and did not tell Ms. Sparks who she was being paid by and where she was from. The attempt, What's in my judgment, Ms. well, Ms. this Sparks. is my regular order, please, Mr. Chairman. If you want a question, well, please go ahead. You're now over time anyway. No, not, I was interrupted, and I'd ask to finish. Okay. I'll okay. Give you another minute. Okay, and and so in any case, we'll let just as your side says, we'll let the public decide. I just have one other point that I would like to make to you, Mr. Chairman, not related to this. I thank you, Dr. Sparks, and that is 
that, uh, Ms. Sparks, sorry, um, that uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Micah have complained Wednesday that members haven't been able to see the illegal guns found in the Davidian compound, and I agree that we ought to see those guns, and so I just want to let the committee know that I've asked the Justice Department to bring all of those guns to Washington. The Justice Department has agreed it will be happen. Their guns will be brought to Washington next week, and all the members can see these guns for themselves. And with that, I yield back my time. Uh, one quick question. Do, does that mean that we now have approval to have those guns x-rayed in a, in a, in a third-party opinion of uh, whether they've been altered, when they were altered, before or after the fire? You, well, you seem to have connections to with the Justice the, Department. We don't, we don't well, have the same. Let me tell you the history, if the gentleman might yield. The history was Perfect. that you had sent a letter a month ago requesting uh, making that request. The Justice Department sent you back a letter saying they would try to comply with the request and then had no answer from you. When I saw Mr. Micah's letter this morning, Your it time. renewed, please, Your if you're asking right. me a question, I think I'll take another 20 seconds and get the story out. And that is, when I saw Mr. Micah's letter this morning, again asking and saying, why couldn't all the guns come up, I renewed a request to the Justice Department. They told me, yes, I don't want anything to be private here, and I'm making okay. that I think, notice I think the public comment to came the came back that the state of Texas, it was going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars. This came back from the Justice Department. That's why we were surprised to see the, those, uh, those weapons here. Right. Moving, moving on to uh, Mr. Heineman. Uh, parliamentary inquiry. Yes. What State your inquiry. If, if I were going to bring a, uh, one of the Bradley tanks in here, uh, what would be the procedure for, uh, would we have to have the doors widened and uh, uh, submitting it as evidence? No, uh, just go through the doors. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Kinda like they didn't wake up, while, right? I mean, while, a, while a gentleman is not stating a legitimate parliamentary uh, inquiry, I believe the gentleman from Michigan appropriately answered it. Uh, Mr. Heineman. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield 30 seconds to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hyde, and four minutes and 30 seconds to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. I thank the gentleman for yielding me 30 seconds. I think it's incumbent on Mr. Schumer and his side to explain to this committee in regular order how Mrs. Sparks' testimony has been tainted by the deceit imposed upon her and us by the National Rifle Association. I concede that was deceitful and untrue, but how do you leap from that act of cupidity to taint? That's the core of your obstructionism during all these hearings, is that the NRA has tainted. Now, I take if Mrs. Sparks' testimony as free, as fair, as full, and as untainted. Do you feel tainted? by this NRA no. lady? Is your testimony yield? in any way affected by it? I said things to Ms. Hager, I said things to Ms. Hager that I probably would have been more careful how I put my language together. But you say that to us too, wouldn't you, the same things? Well, but I didn't lie to her. But I, I'm just real cautious about people who are not up front with me because I don't know their agenda. You were deceived, but, but it hasn't affected your testimony here today, has it? It was her method that I was concerned with. Yield? It has not affected, my, has not affected well, my testimony. But it has not, just a minute, I'm trying to make a point. It has not affected your testimony. No, Would sir. Thank Mr. you Chairman. very much. Would the gentleman yield? I suppose, but I, I don't have that much time. Mr. Time was already yielded. Well, wait a second. No, it's Mr. Souter's time. He has a right to yield, if, he, if not, or he can use his own time. I'm going to use my own time. We already have under oath that it didn't affect her testimony, uh, that uh, this is typical of delaying tactics. All we've heard this whole hearing is there's no new evidence. We get new evidence, and the next thing we know, there's a diversionary tactic. I already said I was sorry uh, for something we didn't do, we didn't have anything to do with. I'm upset that we keep hearing about it when it didn't affect the testimony. It wasn't any part of us. We're trying to go through what does appear to be new evidence, what does appear to be uh, attempted cover-up by the federal government, and we need to get into the questioning regarding what we're supposed to be doing with this committee. Mr. Evans, could you, you were in the process of elaborating on these different memo, memos. Could you tell us about the second shooting that occurred on February 28th? 
Well, there was also a false affidavit in connection with that second shooting. And I can elaborate on that. I have a copy of it. And the reason I can say it is is because they gave the affidavit on, one, on the one hand and on the other hand, an interview from one of the Texas Rangers of, the age, of another ATF agent gave information to show that that affidavit just wasn't true. That second report from the ATF agent, uh, Mr. Marvin Richardson, an honest agent, a good man, said that when he examined my client's gun, it, it did not appear to have been shot or fired. He smelled it, he looked at it, and it hadn't been shot. Another agent swore an affidavit to hold, that, that contributed to holding my client in jail without bond for a year and said that my client had shot at them, made the definitive statement that he shot, withholding the information that had, they had known for months before that was in this other report. They didn't give me that report till the eve of trial in violation of this very Brady doctrine we've been talking about. And if I get a chance to ever get through the rest of those blow-ups over there, I can show four or five more instances when uh, they have said this. Listen, uh, would you move that and go to the blow-up? Uh, yeah, right there. That, that, that's hand, somebody's handwritten notes that say, Texas Ranger, Ray Yon does not want them, Chuck, Phil, that's the two supervisors, re-interviewed because Jan does not want any more exculpatory statements generated. Exculpatory means it might tend to show that somebody facing life without parole might be innocent. And it says right there in black and white. Now, some, they try to explain this to say, well, uh, that just meant we didn't want a lot of additional reports generated. Or that just meant, you know, we, have, we don't want to, what? compromise the prosecution. You don't want to compromise the prosecution by revealing evidence that might tend to show that somebody is not guilty of the charges? Well, that's not where we are in this country, I hope. Let's keep going through there. I won't... If well, you my, can my time come to a conclusion in 10 seconds, it would be great. Well, I, there's one other document that's not blown up that, that I received in the documents that were introduced by Mr. Barr, and it says this. Uh, statements, uh, statements, should the, statements from agents, should they go to the USA, U.S. Attorney, or us, do, do they want us to create new, and then it stops, and then it says, asking questions to which would require us to make new documents, and then in parentheses the word exculpatory. What are we talking about? Making new documents, in parentheses, exculpatory. We're going to have to uh, move, and I thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Collins, uh, you have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield the same lengthy 30 seconds <laughs> to Mr. Conyers that was, that was uh, yielded to Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Mrs. Collins. Uh, with reference to whether uh, the uh, evidence was tainted, it's the attempt to taint, not whether it was successful or not. This is a, a very strong woman before us here. And Mr. Chairman, for your information, if, if you didn't get the point, in 18 United States Code Section 1512, it prohibits the use of misleading conduct to influence witnesses before an official hearing, including before a hearing of Congress. That carries a criminal penalty. And I thank the gentlelady from Illinois for yielding to me. Reclaiming my time. Ms. Marks, I, uh, uh, doctor, I understand that Dr. Perry, who later interviewed the children who survived, testified that the adults in Mount Carmel compound had apparently instilled in the children a strong reluctance to tell outsiders of any physical or sexual abuse. Now, is that consistent with your contacts with the children before the trial? That's correct. David worked real hard to keep the children away from any outside contact. They were not even in public school. They were not in public school? No. Did you ever hear of any accounts of young children locked up as punishment in places where there were rats? Uh, that, that was a part of one of our initial uh, allegations, and I did talk with the child about that. Um, he was very good at being evasive. Uh, he, he was real uncomfortable with the question. And finally, as we talked, he said, well, you know, there was one time, but it was a long time ago. Uh, later, in talking to, to others, um, I asked Steve Schneider, 
uh, an adult at the compound about that incident and he did remember something like that and there was some statement to, to Cyrus about uh, do you want to sleep in the garage and there are rats there but he said oh it was nothing Mm. So he did not admit that the child was actually put there, but the child was very nervous about the question. Let me get this straight. At the time that the agency file on David Koresh was closed, did you have the information you later had from uh, Carrie Jewell? Um, I, ha I had had some contact with Carrie Jewell. At that time, she was not willing to really talk about it. It was not until... Uh, just prior to the raid that she had decided she wanted to testify and that's when I did the interview with her. Would you be able to say why it was at that particular time that she decided she wanted to testify? I, I really wasn't involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, the ATF agents came to me with a sexual abuse referral and uh, that's when I, I, I got involved with it. Do you feel that his followers, David Koresh's followers, can accurately say that he was fully investigated and found innocent? Not at all. Go ahead. During your visits, you did have uh, several opportunities to talk to children. Do you have any opportunities to talk to adults beside the children? Yes, I did. And, and, and what was your general feeling after you talked with these adults? They, they truly adored him. He was very much in charge. Sometimes they sort of seemed to set up the conversations we had, but you could tell that, that uh, they, they were basically doing what he had said. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned something about uh, the 45th Psalm. Yes. Now, now, what impact did that have on his religious teachings? Well, that was basically the introduction. It was, it was the wedding song. Um, uh -huh. w when we were talking about studying and, and he wanted to teach me the seven seals, that was a really important passage to him. Um, and some of that goes, I mean, if I paraphrase that, some of this says, my heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my, uh, my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of the mighty writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever, etc. Those kinds of things were what he sort of used as a religious doctrine. Yes, and, the, and then he told me that you, you must learn by tasting. By tasting. Yes. I think to take a break, your time has expired. Uh, we are going to take a recess for tw uh, 20 minutes. And uh, we will uh, adjourn here at 10 of. And uh, we thank you for your patience. We'll reconvene in 20 minutes. Huh? No, no. We're taking a recess for 20 minutes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Boyer from Indiana will start. This was the third day of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committees. We'll continue testimony in a moment, but first, some program information. Saturday on America and the Courts, we mark the five-year anniversary of Justice William...